great to be here. Uh, these days, if you go to America to a bar and you sit down with a bunch of guys, you know, men, then what do you talk about? Ten years ago, we talked about, you know, money, cars, women, maybe. But today, when you sit down and talk to people, what do they say? They say, look what kind of apps I have. Like you're swapping apps in the bar. I mean, this is pathetic, of course. But that's what happens when you sit down with guys. Everybody pulls out their phones and, and compares apps, right? That's what we do now at the bar. It's a, it's a very strange world. Right? That makes me wonder about where we're going. I think, basically, um, the future is going to be very, very interesting. Because one thing we can imagine, of course, now is that everyone else in Brazil and Russia, India, China, uh, Indonesia, uh, worldwide, all these people are coming online in vast numbers. They're called the other three billion. Okay? And Google has invested in a company called uh, O3B, the other three billion. They're putting 18 satellites into a low-flying orbit for the southern hemisphere to go online without having to use a telecom. So imagine this, you can make phone calls without a SIM card. Like if you're in Jakarta or Singapore or Lagos, Nigeria, one of the most beautiful places in the world, just kidding. Now, if you go there and you can make a phone call without actually having an operator, and you can get on the web for free. This is all coming. So I work as a futurist. My Twitter handle is G. Leonhardt. My company is called The Futures Agency, and we're sort of, as it says, we're agents for the future. We're trying to help companies to reinvent themselves. So it's a very simple mission accomplished usually in 10 minutes, but just kidding. Um, so let's start right here. I mean, you're all aware of this. We have an explosion in how people use the mobile Internet. In fact, some people are saying that we're going to have maybe 10, 15 percent of the Internet on mobile devices in five years. I think it's going to be the reverse. 90 percent of all Internet traffic will be on mobile devices. Because these boxes over here, computers, right, they're for work. That's what they do. Right? Mobile internet is not about work. It's about connecting. It's about banking. It's about buying stuff. About recommending. About downloading. You know, all these things, sharing things. Right? So look at the traffic that we're seeing here. I mean, from a measly 300 petabytes or so in five years to 7,000 petabytes a month. Right? I mean, just mind-boggling. So let's ask a simple question. How are the telecom companies, the mobile operators, the ISPs going to make money when they have to pay for all this throughput? Every single telecom and mobile operator around the world, and we work with a lot of them, is going to move up into media, content, entertainment, and advertising. It's called the telemedia economy. And this will bring a huge amount of money also into things like books and publishing and music. In five years, or probably sooner, we will all have music bundled into our mobile phone. So you subscribe to Vodafone or whatever you have here, right, or, or uh, other local providers, and the music is included. So it's going to be an interesting world. I mean, if you see how much data we're consuming, of course, in Korea, people are already consuming, you know, I don't know, 30, 30 gigs a month. Right? But look at the growth here. I mean, it's absolutely mind-boggling in all countries around the world, and 50 billion devices connected to the Internet in 2020. Devices, right? So that's also things like, like cars and, and book, bookshelves and, and stuff you buy at the grocery store and subway locations and banner ads outside and so on and so on. So data explosion will be absolutely huge. So we're entering what I call a mobile society. If you haven't gotten with the program, to get your company on mobile, you're in big trouble. That's basically where all the action is going to be. So if your website doesn't look good on the mobile phone, it's time you fix this. And this is something that's crucial because obviously most people will look at stuff on mobile devices of all different shapes and forms, not just iPads, of course, but all over the world. So there's this key question, of course. Now publishers are saying, well, this is cool because now on the mobile we can charge people. But it's not so easy. It's not just putting up a mobile app and saying, okay, people will pay $5 for Wired Magazine on the iPad. Turns out 100,000 did it for the first edition, and now it's like eight or 9,000. Right? So it didn't quite work out in the same way. So now what's happening is the question is really about mobile, not, not just about apps. I mean, apps are just one way to use the mobile. 
And the open internet, HTML5, of course, is going to drastically explode there as well, open apps. Right? Kleiner Perkins, who is an investor, I think, in Facebook, they summarize very nicely what's going on today. It's about social, it's about local, it's about mobile, and I add video. Those are the four things you need to be doing. If you're a branding agency, if you're a company, if you're promoting yourself, if you're writing books, if you're an artist, it's all about these things. And we didn't have any of this, really, two years ago. The Internet was just the Internet of web pages, right? So it was a, the primitive version of the Internet, you could say. Right? Now it's all about this. And we're looking at a global budget of roughly $1 trillion that is spent on reaching us, called advertising. Advertising, marketing, public relations, all that stuff that nobody really wants to hear. Right? You know, lies, interruption, those kind of things. Right? That's all going to move onto the mobile, onto social networks, onto interactivity and video. Of course, a huge opportunity for all of us, I think. Now, this is basically our reality, right? I mean, it's interesting. Today, I read an article just this morning, came in my inbox and said, Facebook will beat Google because Google just has fossil, fossil information, old, like, museum type of information, right? Because when you go to Google and you search for best sushi in London, you'll find all kinds of stuff, you know, including the Guide Michelin and what have you, right? But it's not from yesterday. If you go to search.twitter.com when you're in London, you put in Sushi London, and you see reviews, and when you get to the place, they're still sitting there eating. Right? <laughs> so it's real live information. Right? And maybe sometimes the reviews aren't honest, but then you can go and complain to them. Right? I said yesterday at the dinner when we had, you know, if, if in Germany, if you go to a restaurant, you put your iPhone on the table, you bring up TripAdvisor, put the app on, you know, just put it on the table like this, right? you will get better service. Right? <laughs> Because people are saying, wow, this, this guy is going to make a bad comment about, you know, and, and they know what TripAdvisor is, believe me. Right? So it's about nowness, right, when we're searching for information. And this is what apps can do, of course. They're about now. They're not about yesterday. There's also bad parts to this, because obviously it's not always valid to just look for now, you know, just like it's not valid to always look on the surface. But basically, Facebook is, of course, the provider of this nowness effect, it's all about what's happening now. And you know, this is why I have my app here. You can download for free on the internet, uh, also for Android. It's because this nowness effect is really, really important. People want to track what you're doing, where you are, what you're saying, and so on. It's very important. This is a very interesting app. Last night never happened, it's called. You can go and wipe out all of the posts from last night when you were drunk, posting on Twitter and Facebook. <laughs> So this is a very popular app, right? Uh, I don't know, I think it's free, but I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, they can charge for this, and you can't sell music on the internet, but you can sell this, right? It's kind of a, an interesting effect. There's also a really great app I like a lot. It's called Type and Walk. If you have a Blackberry, you can download this app, and you can see the street in front of you through the camera while you're typing. It's also very useful. <laughs> anyway, after nowness, it's also about hearness. Right, nowness and hearness, that people are interested where we are, and this checking in thing is going to be absolutely huge. But it's going to be built in into everything we do. Because it's very important to share locations. For example, when you're out in, the, in, a, in a soccer stadium watching a game, it's very useful to see where your friends are sitting. Right? Wouldn't be that useful when you're out in Amsterdam <coughs> doing all kinds of things. You know, maybe you wouldn't switch that off, but it's a different reality when you get into nowness, right? Basically connecting with people. And this, of course, is mostly done by kids today. And then we have this interesting convergence that's happening, is newspapers are becoming TV stations, and TV stations are becoming newspapers, and, and uh, record companies are becoming publishers, and so on. So we have this convergence, right? Books you can watch, in TV you can read. So guess what? If you're in the media business today, that means you're in all of the media business. And that's a real challenge because most journalists aren't so happy to be on video. They never signed up to be on video or to make an audio podcast, right? But that's our reality. It's a multimedia world now. It's a cross-media platform. And then we have this. This is a huge change in terms of money. This is what keeps the banks up at night in companies like Visa, American Express, PayPal. Mobile apps that you can pay with. 
I would venture to say in five to ten years we won't be using a lot of credit cards. Here in Europe, of course, credit cards are really established, just like America. But in developing countries, people will use the mobile app to send money. This is Google Wallet. Works with an NFC chip, near field communication. If you download the app, you have the chip on, you can go in a grocery store and pay with this thing. You can already do that, of course, in, in Sweden and other places. Right? But imagine this, right? Imagine you can go somewhere, anywhere in the world, you can send the person sitting next to you who has just given you a book, right? You can send them $10 through the mobile. That is going to be the reality very, very soon, and apps will do that as well. And Facebook money, Facebook credits, will become the biggest currency after the dollar. I'm not joking. Maybe even before the dollar. Bad dollar for the bad thing for maybe the euro. You know, who knows? I don't hope so. But basically, what's happening on Facebook is that you can make money and you can spend money. So if you buy Facebook credits, you can already buy real-life things like Delta Airlines tickets or Warner Brothers movie downloads. You can watch Batman on Facebook. You can already do that. I don't know why you would do that, but you can do that. So money. 2.0 is a huge thing because money is content, after all. Right? Money is moving onto the web, into the cloud. And now we have all these companies getting into apps. Of course, you've noticed that now there's apps on the computer and widgets that you can install there. Right? Very soon we have apps on the television. Every single television will be connected to the Internet in the next two years. There won't be a television that's not on the Internet automatically onto your wireless network doing all these things, so you can have your widgets and Flickr, you can really be distracted all the time. But Audi now says, okay, they're getting into making apps, so very soon you can download an app and the speedometer can be a Disney, you know, a Mickey Mouse or something, you know. You can change that. You can change all the things in the car. And the other thing that Audi is doing is they're working on something very interesting. Here's a short video on this. The self-driving car. Why in the world would you buy a car that you're not driving yourself, right? I mean, it's, <laughs> this is, of course, mad, right? But Audi knows that in the next five to ten years, self-driving cars, wh where we just sit there and do our email or whatever, <laughs> or eat, or other things, you know, Audi knows that this is going to happen. And this is going to be a big part of their business, which is cars that drive themselves. So all of a sudden, we're basically looking at new roles in a new ecosystem. So telecom companies will get in the movie business, and they will get involved with entertainment. Publishers will also get involved in that end, of course, on with telecoms and so on. So we're going to ra radically change how we do things. And basically what we see now is that if you have kids, you know what I'm talking about, right? Kevin Kelly says, we're no longer people of the book. We're people of the screen. And this is a whole new reality. People off the screen are just not the same kind of people. Because they can instantly rate things, they can recommend stuff, they can forward things, they can share. Right now, 23 million uploads every day on Flickr. 23 million new photos. 20, uh, 22 billion minutes spent per day on Facebook. That's every fourth minute on the Internet. And what are people doing there? They're sharing stuff. Right? That's what they do there. So the idea of people off the screen is going to be humongous. I mean, we're talking about huge branding possibilities, direct connections with fans. There's a website called Kickstarter that you may know. There used to be one here in Holland called Celeband. But Kickstarter allows people to fund projects that they like directly. And last year, Kickstarter raised $47 million for people where you can go and say, I want to write a book. My fans will fund my next book. Um, you know, of course, it doesn't work for everyone, but it's the uh, direction that we're going. And then, of course, you have people doing all kinds of things with screens. You know, that's kind of aberrations. But if you have kids, you know what I'm talking about. So here you see the typical weapon of the consumer. Uh, this is an app called Flight Tracker. If you use Flight Tracker, you can be sitting at the gate. And if there's a delay in the flight, you will know about this earlier than the woman at the gate. 
because Flight Tracker has all the cool data, and the woman knows nothing, and she doesn't care. Right? This is the worst part, of course. Right? So this is user empowerment. Right? So you know the flight is canceled. You, you can be the first one to rebook. Right? I mean, this is what everybody's doing now. Right? It's total consumer empowerment. So the record labels, the media publishers, the companies, the banks, insurances, the governments, they have to put up with us now. And if you're running a company that wants to sell anything, if you don't empower the user, it's basically day over for you. I mean, this is the whole thing you need to do is basically empower people in an environment that doesn't mean your marketing is going to be about captive customers. You know, in marketing, we use all these military terms, you know, campaigns and targets and, and uh, mission accomplished. And, you know, as we're in the army. Right? It's not about the army. It's more about Woodstock right? for marketing. And it's basically saying, okay, we need to untie these people and empower them. This is from my iPad last week. I love the iPad, I love Apple stuff, but many of these things are just pure prison, right? I mean, I connect my iPad to a display, and it says I can't play my iPad connected to this display because it would be possible, in theory, to record from the display. Right? Imagine the lunacy of this. Right? I mean, I pay three euros for this movie. I can't use a display because I could possibly record it. Right? I mean, what kind of paranoia is this? I mean, this is the best way to be hated. Right? I mean, talking about the music business, right? I mean, four years straight in America, the Recording Industry Association of America is the most hated company in America. Right? And why is that? Because they do this every single day. You can't do this because we have other plans for you. Just sign up. Yeah. So that's the antidote to the empowerment. And what we're seeing right now, the music industry has to be greatly complimented on this. Uh, the revenues have declined by 71% in 10 years. Right? So mission accomplished. You've made yourself superfluous. Right? There's a lesson that we can learn from this. Right? Basically, don't do this. Anything you do to take away the power from the consumer, they will find out. They will make it impossible for you to do this because now everything that we do is moving into the cloud. And yesterday was the announcement from Apple, iCloud. In my view, not really a big deal. It seemed bigger than it was. But, but we already know this. Spotify, Zimfy, all the cool music services, Netflix in America, right? Everything is moving in the cloud. So music, movies, television, Education. All of our educational materials, textbooks, slideshows, videos will all be available in the cloud, already are from MIT, for example, in the Open Courseware project. Right? Government records, health. You'll have an app that basically has your entire records in the phone. And if you want to give your records to the, art, to the, to the doctor when you're, when you're in a car crash or something, you can just pull it off your phone. All in the cloud. I mean, this is basically going to happen, and it's going to be a huge change in terms of how we live, because when we don't have the cloud, we can't do anything. It's like, have you ever experienced when you have car navigation, and you're in the middle of a city, and you have to make a turn, and it goes off, there's no satellite, right? So then you're in trouble, you just have to make your own guess. Right? That's a big problem. So everything moving into the cloud, and then we have a big change in society, as we, we can see now on a worldwide level, we can no longer make money by ourselves. This is kind of interesting because until now, we have big empires, media companies, banks, making lots of money, you know, Disney, Universal. You know, it was possible to run the business entirely by yourself. But in the last 10 years, we've come up with companies that are essentially networked companies. Right? They're, they're actually co-creating a model. That's Google, eBay, Skype, Twitter. 80% of Twitter traffic does not come from Twitter.com. It comes from a 1,000 companies who build the tools on top of Twitter, like Hootsuite and TweetDeck and all the cool stuff that we're using. And if Twitter goes offline, all of these things are gone as well. So we're now entering an in the interdependent society. This is a great movie that just came out, ConnectedTheFilm.com. Here's a short clip from this movie so you can understand what I'm trying to illustrate here.
So this is the business model of the future, right? Don't refuse this. You have no choice. You cannot actually be completely independent and make it work. It's not possible. Because everything is connected now. Every commercial process, every buying and selling is connected, whether it's business to business or consumers. Right? It's about interdependency. And of course, that's what apps are teaching us as well. Right? We have to connect to other people's databases. Right? The coolest stuff today happens through APIs, application platform interfaces. So you can, you can mash up Google data and Twitter data and Facebook data and all kinds of other things. And for example, Flipboard that you may know, right? It's, it's a great app, would be impossible without this. The Guardian, the most popular English-speaking online newspaper in the world right now, they give away all of their stories and their data through an API. You can just go in and create your own newspaper from their data. Right? It's very powerful. So now we're also people of the cloud. I'm sure Steve Jobs is very happy about this one. Uh, because now we like this, right? We like to live in a fluid society. So when you go to Swiss.com or Lufthansa.com, you can buy a ticket online, but you can't rebook. Right? You have to call them. And guess why? Because they don't like you to understand how all the rebooking works. Right? EasyJet, you can do whatever you want. Right? Okay, you have to pay for it, 30 euros. Yeah? Okay, but you can do it. Right? This is empowerment. Now what we have here is we like fluid stuff. Anybody is using Spotify here? Any Spotify users? Yeah. This is fluid. What a great business model. I mean, if the record labels wouldn't be so obsessed with killing it, maybe we would have a chance of having it around for a while. Right? So Spotify, Instapaper, anybody use Instapaper? It's a lifesaver, right? It, Instapaper is an app that allows you to download w uh, web pages and articles and read them offline. Ever since I started using Instapaper, which is free in the basic version, uh, I'm saving 100 pages a day of printing, right? Because it makes it fluid and easy anywhere I want. I mean, all the other stuff, just absolutely amazing, right? And of course, the iCloud from yesterday. Very soon, I think we have this, right? We have iThink from Apple, which will connect us very deeply into the Apple universe. Yeah. I, I'm sure that's the next plan, yeah. But jokes aside, uh, this is a very serious thing, right? This is extremely threatening to most of us because, in fact, we like to be the network. Right? The network meaning ABC, CBS, Universal, you know, Goldman Sachs, Toyota, big brands, right? The big central entity that you see here on the left. But the reality is today, because we're becoming a network society, that means we can find out stuff. Before I go to the meeting with you, I'm going to check out LinkedIn to see if I can find who you are. Right? Everybody does that now. We're becoming a network society, so all of a sudden we're going from this idea of one to many, you know, broadcasting, to the idea of many to many. And I can tell you one thing, of course, many to many is quite a chaos. I mean, this is Twitter, it's like 98% garbage, right? I mean, let's be honest, it's lots of stuff happens there that you don't want to see, right? So you need filtering. But the many-to-many -many is a very, very interesting proposition because what it does is like it actually uh, relates. We're going from MTV to YouTube. Right? Took 18 months for YouTube to become more relevant for kids than MTV. 18 months. I mean, if you want to watch music videos or listen to music, where do you go? YouTube. And MTV is still here, but of course, they're really, really struggling. Right? And, of course, the biggest part is that people will start switching the advertising budgets. So what companies are saying is like, okay, we used to advertise here, you know, big television, print, which is declining heavily, I mean, especially here in Holland, right? Radio. They're shifting a trillion dollars advertising budget. It's a trillion dollars. I mean, it's absolutely it's mind-boggling how much money people spend to reach us and pitch us stuff, right? It's shifting to the network society. So we're basically looking at a situation to where, you know, the, the Dutch broadcasters have to face the fact that Facebook is a broadcaster. Right? Facebook is going public next year. They will probably raise $100 billion. They could buy all of the record labels. By then, it'll be $5 each. Right? But just kidding. Um, they can get into the business of broadcasting, right? Right now, they're broadcasting us to each other. And that's it, right? But they can add movies or, or television shows, and they will. 
So if you're a broadcaster in this audience, I hope there's a few, you have to get with the program and become networked. Because you do have a great audience, right? But you have to actually be both. I mean, they're obviously interrelated. They're not going to switch off. I mean, broadcasters will be around. But in this world, we're going from broadcast to broadband. And this is why apps are so important. Because apps are, of course, they can be on television. But we're going to a world of where we like to do this. That we have the choice of 50,000 TV stations on the web. And of course, the choice makes it hard to, to choose, right? But that's, we'll have to have different program guides for this. And also, we're doing this, right? Seth Godin says, all of us live in tribes. And this is very true because it's a human factor, of course. There's about 150 people around us that are important. <coughs> and they can be online, offline, or both, of course, right? But basically, we're connecting through mobile devices. And we're now living in a broadband world. Did you know that uh, every 10% increase in broadband or mobile penetration means 1% increase in GDP? People make more money when they're connected. That's a fact. Every single government around the world wants people to go online to save money and produce new economies. So now in a broadband society, and we're, we're completely different. This model will be turned upside down. So one thing we have to do, all of us, and this is hard because becoming networked means we actually have to listen. Okay. I should be talking because I'm not usually listening, I'm usually talking. Right? But we have to start listening because in a networked society, it's about conversation. It's not about monologue. This is how you do stuff. This is how you actually learn stuff. This is how you make things work. Right? And the New York Times has allowed millions of people to log in and create their own page in the New York Times. I have my own page there. Great move because, you know, as, for example, the Huffington Post, many of you know, right? social news. It's obvious, right? People can read what I read and we can share very powerful stuff. Cosmopolitan magazine on Facebook, you can read. Right? Wall Street Journal on Facebook. You see how many companies are already getting more leads in terms of traffic from social networks than they are getting from Google. CNN, USA Today, People Magazine, the, uh, the, the blue bar is traffic from social networks. If you're not engaged in so-called social networks, right, you have to get in because it's about the network society. It's not about Facebook or Twitter. Right? It's about having a conversation. You see how many pages are now getting the Facebook like button? I mean, you can't even get around anywhere on the web. I mean, now we can go to real places like, like a slide uh, in, a, in a fun park and you can like the slide. You know, you can actually like real life things. Right? I mean, it's absolutely mind boggling. So this is your new television and radio. I mean, that's Twitter news network, TNN, be bigger than CNN in less than five years. Put the fear of God into the cable, guys. It's like cable television without the cable. Right? It's going to be absolutely huge. And, and there will be a tab here in about 12 months that says music. You just click on the tab and off you go. Right. So brands must now also become network, which means they have to become human. If you're trying to sell something, you can't just be sort of an amorphous entity that pitches you stuff. Right? You have to become human. This is uh, American Express, the open forum. A really cool app. Hundreds of thousands of people discussing financial stuff on the web and on the app, hosted by American Express. That makes them human, even though they're definitely not human in terms of, you know, they're obviously a big company, right? But this makes them more tangible. This is really what it's all about. That's how you create apps. Now, the Amazon mantra in this context, and if you, if you use the Amazon apps, uh, it's pretty mind-boggling how it interfaces with all the other stuff that you're doing especially Kindle and so on, right? Their motto is nurture extreme customer satisfaction. They'll do anything, literally anything, to make you happy. They bought Zappos, the most successful company on the web in the last couple of years, for a billion dollars. You could call the hotline at Zappos. I tried it myself because I wanted to see if it's true. You can call the hotline and talk about your divorce problems with the person, and they will hang on the line for hours. And they will give you therapy, right, Zappos. I mean, this is amazing. Right? Amazon just two months ago went and said, we're going to get in the movie business to distribute movies like Netflix. Right? And they're giving all of the American premium users, which are free shipping, 
5,000 movies for free to watch. It's a present. So if you're an Amazon user in America, you can watch 5,000 movies to stream for free. Imagine if we could do that here. Right? I mean, this would be a mind-boggling way forward. Kids and the iPad. Clearly, if we're going to get into the future and make money with this way and actually generate revenues, we have to think about web mobile native products. Native means native, you know, it means starting from there, not ending there. Right? We're not on the web, we're off the web, right? We're, we're coming from the web. So if you're coming up with a marketing strategy for digital natives, not kids, right, you've got to think about what they do already not what you want them to do. I mean, this is a whole different cup of tea. So if we're going to come up with apps that are supposed to make money, they must be unique, they must be irresistible, they must be totally affordable, they must be a wipeout. And there are a few, for example, I love these two. Flipboard, of course, is not from publishers. Ha, huh, needless to say, they didn't invent it themselves. But this is the most popular app for reading now. And the other one I really like is Popular Science from Bonier in Sweden. They really hit a gold mine because instead of saying that you have to buy the magazine every time, it's $15 a year for all of the magazines. If you like this kind of stuff, it's a good deal and it's really a great app. Right? So very soon those will be free because they'll be app uh, sponsored by advertisers and so on. Now we also have this idea that we can start selling direct. This is where it gets really interesting, right? I mean, imagine you have three billion people using apps, which will be roughly three to four years, you know, worldwide. And also imagine that we're going to have automated translation. So all your Dutch stuff is available, just hit the button, hear it in Chinese. Right? Sounds like science fiction? Already works. Google has already demonstrated software where I can make a phone call and speak in German, and it comes out of Hungarian. Already works. It's just you know, it's cumbersome and a little bit expensive. But basically, selling direct becomes important now because now we can say, like, like these guys from O'Reilly Publishing, we can add in-app commerce so when people are ready to buy, they can buy from us. This will be a, a bit, you know, maybe a year or two until this really takes off. But Kindle, for example, Amazon now allows the authors to write short books, which I love because you don't have to spend a thousand hours, you spend a hundred hours, right? You can write a 40-page book, and it's a dollar, or two dollars. It's a no-brainer, right? So a whole new format comes up. So when you think about commerce on apps, think about new formats. Think about new ideas rather than replicating the old stuff, which won't work. Right? So apps are clearly not a magic wand. Here's our friend Rupert Murdoch. Right? He says, we'll have young people reading newspapers. It's a real game changer because now I can finally make more money. Right? It's not going to work. They won't read newspapers, they will read news. Take out the papers. They're interested in news, but it's all about the wrapping. I mean, if you look at here, it's like the amount spent on apps. It's quite interesting from the Wigan Entertainment uh, uh, Congress recently, but not a magic wand. This is even more depressing if you think about selling stuff, right? You're going to have to be a bit smarter than that like, you know, my way or the highway, like uh, Rupert likes to do with his newspapers. You know, you come in, you, you tell the booger off and pay. Right? That's not going to work. Basically here, paying for mobile content, clear answer, how much would you pay? Answer is, would not pay for this. Right? 70%, 80%. So what you have to do is you have to say, well, let's see if we can bundle it and package it and include it and start with the free version and upsell. Right? The most successful business in this decade of the internet is the gaming business. Right? What do they do? It's the addiction model. They let us download stuff for free. World of Warcraft, yeah? you download, you play for 10 hours, and then it says, now you played for 10 hours, you can give us $20 and you can unlock a bunch of weapons. Right? Or you can get the next 50 levels and 80% of people are converting because they're already in, and it's not a lot of money. So this kind of idea of packaging, upselling, right? And clearly I get this question all the time, will we have closed apps, you know, the Apple universe, or Android and open? The answer is, of course, we'll have both. Right? Depends on what you like. 
We don't live in an, in an yes or no world anymore. This is, of course, unfortunate because we would like it to be more simple, but it's not. Right? The reality is that we live in a completely fragmented world. Some of us are quite happy to go with the closed uh, Apple universe, and I am part of that as well. I, I play on both sides, right? But in general, I think it'll be easier with an open format. So I wouldn't bet on closed formats being the, the winning proposition, but it's probably going to be in both directions. So basically, if you're looking to see where the money is, you know, it's the cloud, the crowd, and mobile devices. That's our future. Connecting the cloud with the crowd, whatever the cloud is. If your cloud is money, if you're a bank, you're going to connect with your users through the mobile device and do something with them. Create a community, calculate loans, transact, pay for things. The cloud and the crowd and mobile devices. So now we're living in this world of uh, you know, plenty of distraction. And this is actually an understatement. I mean, we're going to have um, so many screens that we don't even know where to look. I mean, it's, it's a complete, as Marshall McLuhan said, 1971, the global village is, uh, is a village of chaos, noise, and discussion. And that's basically what we have. I mean, it's fragmentation, aggregation, and this is the most important part. Any brand, whether you're a media company or a music company or a newspaper, it's about curation. It's about creating meaning. For example, a car company, Audi, BMW, Mercedes, people don't buy these cars because they're better. Clearly not, because they're all equally good. I mean, you could say you like brands better, but it's about what you think f is a fit. Right? It's the curation that actually matters. This is why Audi is getting into apps. There will be people buying an Audi because you can customize your speedometer. Sounds bizarre, but that is one of the criteria. Right? So that's what apps do. They allow us to curate. And remember that in Western Europe and in America, in, in, in uh, developed countries, we don't really have a money problem. We have a time problem. So for us, we'd rather have a little spent on something that is relevant and important and timely and useful. We spend something, so our time is more important than money. So therefore, curation is a money maker. That's what newspapers are all about. That's what television is all about if they're good. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit because otherwise we'll be here at midnight and um, you know, as you can see I was quite optimistic on, on your uh, level of exposure here. But Okay, talk about my favorite subject, right? <laughs> Lying. Okay, you can basically say that in the past we spent a, a trillion dollars on either yelling at people through advertising, interrupting them, or just plain out lying to them. We all know that Domino's Pizza isn't good. So Domino's Pizza found out last year when they were relaunching that everybody thought their pizza tastes like cardboard. So they said, well, we can't do this. The first thing before we do marketing, we're going to go and ask people to actually reinvent our pizza. And I think it's called Rethink Pizza or something like that. And this was extremely successful because before they did any marketing, they had to stop lying about their pizza. They had to actually fix it. Right? So if there are issues in your company, whether you're a bank or, or, or a, a movie company or a production company, if there are things wrong, you have to fix those first before you make an app. Right? Because people will find out, and we can find out anything now. I mean, this is, uh, if you go to search.twitter.com, just put in the name of your company or a product, somebody is having a conversation about you at this very moment. So no matter what you think of WikiLeaks, which I happen to think is a little bit overdone in terms of the transparency, but transparency becomes essential now. I mean, essential in the sense you can't hide anything, you can't lie, because it's impossible. I mean, basically people, everyone here today is already public in our profile, so we can find out things about you, right? I mean, what reigns right now is a, a principle that Jeff Jarvis called publicity. That's opposed to privacy. This is, for, for us Europeans, is extremely difficult to understand, right? Because we are interested in privacy. But there is an issue here, right? All of us, because we're in business and you're here doing this, right? You want to be found. That's why many of you, I would bet, are on LinkedIn or Zing or Facebook or Twittering or whatever you're doing, right? 
people are connecting with you, and that's a benefit. But the result is you're a public person. We're now, by default, public. And if we want to be private, we have to go and, and fix it. We have to change our settings. Right? We have to take stuff out. I spent 20 hours two weeks ago wiping out stuff on my Facebook profile, unfriending my wife, my kids, right? just cleaning up. Right? Because the public effect means we have to take responsibility. It's, it's about responsibility, not about regulation. Right? So this is a very, very big learning process because all of a sudden we have the power not just to make fools of ourselves, but as you can see here, this clothing store, Kenneth Cole, was making a joke about the Egyptian revolution, right? saying that really what was happening is that they were queuing up there to buy clothes. Right? This cost them several hundred million dollars in sales, right? this one tweet. Because people were saying, like, there's no way I'm going to buy anything from these people. Right? BP, when the oil disaster happened, BP said, oh, you know, it's just too bad. You know, we'll find a way to fix this, right? Within three hours, he had this website come up on Twitter, BP Global PR, but it wasn't BP. Right? It was somebody playing the role of BP, 170,000 people already on there tweeting as if there were BP, right? Imagine the damage that that caused. Right? So the bottom line is you can engage or you can be engaged. That's your choice. Look at the music companies. 71% right? declined because they refused to be engaged and now they are engaged anyway. Right? It's your choice if you start it or if somebody is going to force you. But if somebody forces you, you have to have a major lawsuit for two years to get rid of this Twitter feed. Right? And it's everywhere on the web, so you better get engaged quickly. Uh, I'm going to get to a wrap-up because I'm, I'm uh, getting kicked off the stage here. Already. Okay, uh, let me give you a quick wrap-up here. I will make a, the slideshow available for downloading later so you can see all the cool stuff you missed. You can also go to girdtube.com and watch about 200 hours of videos. Um, anyway, so an important principle of what's happening in apps and on the web in general is this principle. Freemium feels like free and free. This is not new. It's just more pronounced on the web. All of the success stories that we have today on the web, many of them start with free. I call it feels like free because it's not actually free. It's part of something else that makes money. So the trick is, for example, LinkedIn. Most of you are using it for free or Skype. But LinkedIn made, last year made $350 million dollars. Because some of us choose to pay the $20 to get more. Right? So this idea, basically LinkedIn, Amazon, popular science. Right? Starting with some sort of idea of creating an upsell. This is a very, very important principle. So now let me summarize real quick and then I'll get off the stage. Um, we're living in this world. We're living in a network society of broadband culture that's mobile, that's social, that's video, and you can't refuse. You can refuse, and that's sort of like, you know, live off the grid, on the grid, like Matrix or so, right? It's not that extreme. But this is our world now. And it's completely interdependent. That means you have to be transparent, you have to talk to people, you have to create conversations. So this is the world of where we need to co-invent new business models. If you're a brand, you have to talk to publishers. If you're a publisher, you have to talk to, to uh, labels, I mean to, uh, to ISPs and mobile operators. Right? You have to connect and invent new models. Google is the champion, of course, of this model to create new ecosystems. And it's, it's quite a hard job, actually. Also, it's important that when you do an app or a web page or whatever you do, you create an experience, something really important. Harley Davidson, for example, has a website to where you can go and you can share stories about your rights. Right? It's called the Writing Club. You go there and you share experiences, and that's really what makes it work. The new money is in the cloud and the crowd, and connecting the cloud and the crowd. The next five years, all of our stuff will move into the cloud, and we're going to find interesting new ways to actually synchronize the two. It's not about being noisy. It's about being relevant. So if you're making noise, stop making noise. Okay? Make relevance. <coughs> Otherwise, don't bother, because we're beyond the stage of noise to where it was fun just to tweet 500 times because you can. Okay? Make it relevant. Make it meaningful. 
anything that's not connected to each other and to others will fail. So an app that doesn't connect to the outside world, most of them will fail. Right? Closed gar walled gardens, no matter how nice they are, like Apple's walled garden, is a great garden, beautiful flowers. But they won't fail, but most of them will fail. Right? So don't build a walled garden. And last but not least, this is the bottom line, eh? disrupt or be disrupted. That is the choice that we're having today. Somebody is already looking at your business and saying, wait, wait a minute, we could do this and destroy them. And chances are it will be 1, 000, one of the 1,000 of Google's alpha projects that is going to have some impact on you in the future. So bottom line, what I recommend that you do is you embrace this, right? User control. At all times, like Amazon says, providing a really, really top-level experience, right? So that's the opportunity, user control. When you think about apps, think about user control and empowerment. Thanks very much. Here's my stuff. All my books are free on the web. Just Google GERD free PDF and you'll find it. Thanks very much. <laughs>